Hey everyone, so we're doing a quick stream recap of the 3070 overclocking capabilities. Tested three 3070s on stream. I had already tested the Founders Edition in our review of it, but today we focused on some custom model 3070s. Before that, this video is brought to you by Linode. Linode is a Linux server provider that GN has used for years now for its own servers. Alongside dedicated hosting, Linode also makes it easy to cut out third-party VPN servers and to build your own VPN that you fully control, doable through a few guided clicks in its interface. Linode has hundreds of guides for even more advanced server builds, and with Linode, you can roll out your own services like Plex and Nextcloud for your own media and file sharing services, Gamers Nexus viewers get a $100 credit good for 60 days on new Linode accounts. Visit linode.com slash gamersnexus or click the link in the description below. Right now, the one we stopped with was actually the most disappointing of them from an overclocking standpoint only. It is the colorful iGame, advanced I think is what it's called specifically. It does have a vBio switch on the back. It's a tactile button that you just push. But we had an OC mode, we had all these cards in their OCV BIOS. That doesn't really change the power targets, but it does change like fan behavior, stuff like that. Sometimes it changes power target, but on the EVGA and Asus ones it didn't. And stopped with this card, but we'll start with the best two from the stream. So uh, it took pretty much the same process I take for reviews with overclocking these, taking notes, all that stuff. The Strix 3070 did the best but very fierce fight between it and the EVGA FTW3. So these two closely contested in a battle, and um, the Strix has a very high power budget, so when you max out the power slider, which is 125% against uh, like a 277-watt baseline, it ends up around the 340-watt range total for power consumption, so lots of room to stabilize the frequency. Primary benefit of this card in the testing with its higher power budget was it wasn't hitting power limits, and thermally it's fine too. So there's a little bit of, th of thermal play in there every couple degrees with boost, as always. But for the limits that it was really hitting, it was VREL, so voltage reliability, and then VOP. And VREL you can fix by dragging the voltage slider to the max. So it actually does something. This time we'll talk about that in the review of this card. And that gave us another 15 megahertz or so, just dragging that slider over. So this ran over... I think it was probably around 2160 megahertz or so in the final testing runs. Uh, so Strix did very well. The memory was not as strong as some other cars. G6 is not as strong as G6X in general, but this wasn't even that good from G6 standards. So that was the biggest downside. The memory strength is totally dependent card to card. Silicon variance comes into play. Sometimes manufacturers will specify a certain type of uh, supplier for their memory, and that may influence it, like with the King pin cards, for example. But in this case, memory was its weak point. Still did well, though, and was technically the victor overall for points. And I'll get to the points in a moment. So the EVJ FTW3 was the one uh, that we tried. I, I tried to put up a good fight between the two of these, get them really as closely contested as we could. Unfortunately, it couldn't quite make it. The Asus Strix outperformed the FTW3 by about half a percent in scoring at the end of the day. This is all out of box overclocking, no special VBIOSes, no custom cooling, no liquid nitrogen. So just out of box overclocking behavior. That means you're really, your performance is gonna be contingent on silicon quality, of course, but also the power capabilities afforded to the GPU by BIOS, which is set by the manufacturer. And then the cooling, of course, as well. And even setting the fan curve, so you can, you can gain back some performance in the uh, cooling category. Obviously you've got this big cooler, three fans, you spin them faster, sure, it cools the GPU down maybe another couple degrees, but at some point there's a trade-off where the temperature improvement from the power increase on the fans is actually going to be worse than running the fans at a slower speed and maybe two degrees higher. So these fans, I think EVGAs cost uh, about 12 watts when they are at 100% speed. That's a lot to take out of the power budget that could be going to GPU core. So running them completely maxed out can actually be worse uh, despite running it cooler. So that's the balance we're playing. The scoring for these, uh, so just quickly go over it. The baseline for the Strix was 8608 in Port Royal. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, that's fine because we can do some percent math to show the difference. It, it scales relatively closely to games a lot of the time anyway, not always. And 8608, sorry, 8608 was the score for the Strix, and that was with uh, zero offset anything, 100% power. 
doing 100 megahertz offset got it to 89.06, 125 got it to 89.81, so slowing down here. We did 140, still impressively was stable, and that was 90, 28 points, 96, uh, 90, 62 points at 160 megahertz offset, still no mem. Finally, we settled on 400 megahertz offset mem and 160 megahertz offset core with 125% power. That gave the Asus Strix a score of 9191. So versus baseline, 9191, uh, new minus old, so 8608 divided by 8608 is a 6.8% improvement in the Strix's total score with out of the box overclocking. That put it ahead of the FTW3. FTW3 stopped, when I tested them the same way with the Fan Curve Auto, stopped at 91.44 points. FTW3's baseline was 86.30, technically a little bit higher out of box than the Strix. And uh, that difference, ultimately, was an improvement 91.44 from 86.30, divided by 86.30, uh, about 6%, 5.96%. And... It went to 91.58 when I adjusted the fan curve manually uh, on the Strix, or the FTW3, that is. The Strix we left alone, so it didn't have that same advantage in play. So, those two basically the same. The colorful iGame Advanced, absolutely horrible overclocker. Might be good at other things. We'll find out soon. I don't even know the price of that card yet. These are both $100 more than the Founders Edition card. They're very expensive for 3070s. That puts them $100 away from the 3080. So these are cards that you're either buying because everything else is out of stock or because you're uh, I just want the best of the type of card I'm buying person or you're more appropriately probably really interested in overclocking endeavors, even out of box. So that's really who these are appropriate for. The colorful card we'll look into more soon. So colorful ended up at just a 100 megahertz offset was its final stable core offset memory absolute garbage worst memory i have ever worked with on any device uh couldn't even hold 250 megahertz offset so unfortunately no good there on the overclocking front but we'll test the cooler design and performance noise normalized thermals and stuff in a separate piece later so that's it for this one i'm actually i'm going to leave that stream set to unlisted because there were we had a lot of lag and network issues in that one so I'm just going to leave it unlisted, but I'll go ahead and put a link to it anyway in the description below. Just if you click on it, know that it does have some frame drops and things like that. It improved a lot in the second half, but we had network issues at the beginning. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net. If you would like to pick up one of our new bar runners, which we have on the store in stock and shipping now, and uh, we were showing those off during the stream as well. Thank you to everyone who bought one. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.